1996 was an election year, and so it was a short recession of Congress. And what happens is, if Congress slows down and, and basically adjourns, then the bills that you've introduced go away and you start all over again. But the important thing was that we're able to demonstrate bipartisan support uh, for the concept. Well, the downtime between the June and the administration of the, uh, or the installation of the new, of the new administration in uh, 1997 allowed me to come home to, to Sacramento and prepare a strategic plan. And this is our little original logo of the stamp, which was a teardrop representing the press with the crab through a penny up there and the microscope representing the uh, research aspect. So my plan was to go back in 1997 and pull them all out of Washington. I accepted speaking engagements all over the country. And you know, ladies and gentlemen, sometimes I would go, I would travel five, 600 miles and meet 10 people in the audience. Sometimes they got like here, there were larger people like, like here today. But the point of it was that it was worth going there because even if there were 10 people in the audience, if one person caught on to what I was doing, they would become part of the grassroots advocacy program that was so important to build. And, and that turned out to be a very important aspect of the success of the, uh, of the project that we're taking. I also went after a lot of large organizations. Anybody and everybody had to do with breast cancer, whether it be surgeons, plastic surgeons, um, prosthetists, everybody that had an interest in breast cancer was a target for me. And then we also needed to get uh, uh, media blitz. And uh, we'll talk about that shortly. The targets when I was going to return in 1997 again were all the females in Congress, previous sponsors who had signed the bills in 1996. The California delegation was a prime target for me, with 58 representatives, and many people feel that as California goes, so goes the rest of the country, so they're very important. And then I did a grid search where I looked at previous bills that had been passed that were relevant to breast cancer. There was a mammography quality assurance act and so on. So I took all the representatives and senators who sponsored bills relevant to breast cancer and they were primary targets because they had demonstrated an interest. And then of course you have to get, uh, get supported subcommittee uh, chair and member levels and then at the cabinet and presidential levels. So the publicity PR campaigns we started and we printed up these little brochures and you flip these over and it said, I support HR 3401 and use me on them and uh, start bringing this to the attention of the uh, various legislators. Now, over the course of the project, which is about 18 months, we collected 250,000 signatures. You know, we out in front of Rayleigh's and supermarkets and had a band of volunteers, many of which were my ex-patients who believed in this, and I'll share a secret with you. If you have, if you have a cause that's very dear to your heart, it doesn't matter what it is, you need to get 199 friends to write a letter to Congress. And I'm not talking about 20 sheets with 10 signatures, it's the individual letters. And the reason for that is because the congressional people believe that for every letter that they get, there's 9,999 other people out there who believe in what you're doing, but they won't take the time to write. This letter kept here over and over and over again. So a lot of my patients got behind us and came up with a little um, uh, paper like that to cure breast cancer and so on and so forth. And uh, we count about 250,000 signatures in a little over a year. Now, this is Mercy Damanchek. Mercy uh, was a patient of mine about eight years ago, nine years ago now, and she underwent a mastectomy. Uh, this lady was a short Filipino lady, extremely shy. Um, she was probably one of the most depressed patients I've ever known. She had a terribly difficult time with loss of her breast. We gave her medications, we gave her counseling, we did everything that medicine can do for this woman, and nothing worked. She has such a profound depression, she lost her job, her husband lost her job, the kids started flying out of school. When this project started, she became one of the most powerful advocates in what this project did is with all the medications that we tried to get her in, we her out of her depression. And she became one of the most powerful advocates and would travel around and make speeches and you know advocate for the stand. Unfortunately, about four or five years ago, she was shopping uh, for Christmas presents for her family and was killed in that tragic car accident. And uh, she 
She represented a very, very, very big loss to the breast cancer advocacy community. As I mentioned, I was working uh, out of my own uh, budget on this thing, and uh, I ran into a lady in Cincinnati, Ohio, who was living was to make stamps for different causes. And uh, you, know, you could have a family stamp put on there in front of Christmas cards, whatever. And she would sell these sheets of stamps, they're like 50 stamps for a dollar. So I bought a bunch of these things for her, you know, these are stick of stamps to put on my own little thing. And as I was traveling around the country building the grassroots support, I was handing out these stamps. And I told the ladies, do not use this as a real stamp. You put it on there, but you have to have a real stamp on there as well. Well, of course, they didn't listen. And they started using all these stamps to send letters all over the world. And that is my phone number down there to my office, <laughs> which uh, prompted uh, several phone calls from the U.S. Postal Service saying, hey, you, know, you are committing a felony, and you're going to lose your license, et cetera, et cetera. And I got kind of nervous about that, so I called Senator Feinstein and I said, hey, I think I'm going to with these stamps, because these ladies using these stamps and not being tender stops. So, Ernie, don't worry about it, you know. And, if you get arrested, just call my office and you know, <laughs> take care of it. But as I mentioned, we needed uh, endorsements by a number of prestigious organizations. So I went after that. We wanted to get the media back up. We got into the American Medical Association News, which has a circulation of about 450,000 physicians. Uh, we got into uh, Family Circle. Uh, we got on the cover of the National Cancer Registrar Association. And this is all free ink. This is the way to propagate a cause that you are, because it's basically free. Now, who was the opposition? The opposition was the United States Postal Service, of course, and we'll talk about them shortly. Interestingly enough, the philatelists who were stamp collectors opposed the legislation as well. In fact, they were so aggressive about it that as I was going from room to room to room to talk to legislators, they were right behind me, throwing out the negatives aspects of the, of the legislation. And their big beef was that this is an unfair tax on their hobby. <clears throat> and I could not convince them that if this stamp was ever issued, it would be the first ever fundraising stamp, and it would be a major collector's item. And they didn't get that. Uh, but I will tell you this, I got even with them in the end, and I'll, uh, I'll get to that in a bit later. Now, breast cancer organizations, another interesting, uh, interesting group of people. Um, on a local level, the Breast Cancer Association is usually they're comprised of 40 to 50 women, relatively newly diagnosed, have really good hearts, want to help new ladies who are diagnosed to get through the crisis. As these organizations grow to a state level, they start losing the sign of their mission. Power starts to take over. And when they get to the national level, they've totally lost sight of what they're doing, and they're competing against one another. Who's going to be in the White House? Who's going to be on the media? Who's going to do this? Who's going to do that? And it's very, very sad because instead of being on the same page, they start competing with one another. It's not about the woman in Iowa who gets diagnosed with breast cancer anymore. It's about who's going to get more media attention. So the reason I share this with you is because you know, I'm a great believer in the fact that America is a very philanthropic organization or group of people. And if some of us knew where some of these monies actually go, um, I don't think we be quite as generous. There are some good groups out there, but there are also some things in there. I assume that they're very about that. So let's talk about the post office. The post office said they weren't a business. And I said, you're not a business. Well, you got little orphan handy stamps, and you've got cash cards, and you've got phone cards, and you've got Bugs Bunny stamps, and Bugs Bunny earrings. I said, this sounds like a business to me. In fact, they were such a good business that the second largest employer in the world next to Walmart. And in 1997, they made a billion dollars. Pretty good business. In their defense, they have in the recent years taken some major hits. Every time a gallon of gas goes up one cent, they have 200,000 vehicles on the road every day. Every time a gallon of gas goes up one cent, that costs them $15 million a week. So they have a lot of financial issues. In addition to that, they uh, get about 50,000 suggestions per year and only eight or 10 of those are granted. So they've got a number of issues. Now, how to get a bill? You know, anybody in this room can get a bill introduced. All you have to do is call your congressman or your senator, get your 199 friends, get the letters in there, and they'll introduce a bill. Introducing bills are easy. Getting a bill out of the introductory phase into a committee is where the problems start. 